Greetings from Podcastville. It's Monday, the 27th of May. The podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Let me tell you something. No more anxiety. The summer's coming, and you don't want your balls sweating and your dick smelling like a fucking sewer. That's why you got to trim around the edges. Uncle Joey's here to tell you, don't cut your dick off, fucko. The suffering ends now. With Manscaped, you can get it done without the pain. They got precision tools for the family, jewels. Manscaped has redesigned the electric razor. What we're going to do is this, all right? Church listeners, get 20% off your first order when you use promo code CHURCH at manscaped.com. Let me explain something to you. Manscaped is the future. No more walking around with hairy balls and hair coming out of the fire. No more. Manscaped is going to help you out. Their invention is the Lawn Mow, a handheld razor with skin-safe technology so it won't snick or snag your little butts, your ball sack, or your fucking love stick. And now, the church family, like I said, get 20% off your first order when you use promo code CHURCH at manscaped.com. And if you order the perfect package, which I'll tell you about at the end of the show, they'll also throw in a free travel bag when you use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H. That's manscaped.com. Use promo code CHURCH for 20% off your first order. Keep your balls clean and your fucking love stick shaved with manscaped.com. The church is also brought to you by Onnit. Onnit is the way to go. When it comes to supplements, Onnit's the only company I've been fucking with for the last like eight years. From the protein shake to the Shroom Tech Immune to Shroom Tech Sport to the main motherfucker, Alpha Brain, which is a bunch of nootropics put together to help you think clearer, get you a little bit more focused, and if it doesn't work, on it will give you 100% money back guarantee and they don't want the product. Who all stands behind their supplements like that? Nobody! On it does. So go to onnit.com right now and press in. Church. And get 10% off your first order delivered to your house. Kick this motherfucking meal, Lee. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Uncle Joey here with my main Jersey native. Fuck Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I got Jimmy Florentine in this motherfucker. How are you? Exactly. Son? You know, if you're a true Jersey guy, you didn't like Springsteen. No. If you were a metal guy, he was, you know, you didn't like him. Fuck Springsteen and shit. I liked them later on. Yeah, later on, you'd learn to appreciate them. I got older, but, but we're growing up there. People drove you crazy. Like they would, you know, they would just drive you crazy with that same shit <laughs> of Springsteen. I got tortured as a kid because of my musical taste, and right. I always got trumped. Because I always suddenly pulled out the Beatle card or the Springsteen card. Yeah. And then when John Lennon sh- got died, when he got shot, I was so fucking happy for two days. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have to hear those scumbags no more with the same old. Because you couldn't say nothing. I went to see ACDC last night. Fucking great show. Yeah, but they're not better than the Beatles. And you heard that shit growing up. That yeah. was my beginnings of music from like 74 till John Lennon got shot in 79 or 80. That's all you heard growing up. Yeah, but they're not good as the Beatles. And you couldn't argue with them. They would trump you. You had nowhere to go. Yeah, the Beatles. And then if you Jersey was all about Springsteen. It's like I had a friend that I was friends with since first grade. He was a big metalhead, and he met this really hot chick, and he started dating her. And he hated Springsteen, too. And he went to see Springsteen with her. I didn't talk to him for oh, six yeah. months. People didn't talk to <laughs> I didn't talk to him. People I was so fucking mad at him. Just stopped talking to you. Yeah. I'm like, That's how it. could you betray yeah, us? Besides, we call the cops on you. We'd sell you an ounce of coke, then put the cops on you and shit. <laughs> And then when you call, we put Bruce Springsteen on. Have Bruce, have Bruce bail you out. <laughs> you like Bruce. Hey, born to run. Start running, you fuck. I got bumper stickers made up. There is no reason for Bruce Springsteen, and the boss is a total loss. And I used to put them on people's bumper stickers. I cruise parking lots, oh and if I God. saw someone with a Bruce Springsteen bumper sticker, I'd put that over it on their car. I was out of my mind. I'd put them on every sign. I'd be driving around, put them on signs, put them everywhere. I got like 500 of them made. And I'm thinking to this day, I'm like, why did I do that? For what reason? Why, why do you think music has such like a emotional, like he's just a guy singing, like why, Like you guys hate him. Like you guys like actively, like it's not like, oh, I just don't like him. You don't understand. I hated a couple people. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't have to be musically. Right. I'll tell you who the first person I had more hatred than life for, Richard Gere. <laughs> like I had a personal vendetta against Richard Gere because I was starting to get into the groove. You're starting to hit on girls and shit. You like women. And every woman was in love with Richard Gere. When I was starting to sprout, 
every woman. And then he fucking came out in American Jiggle and showed his ass. <laughs> yeah. And that was the end. You couldn't compete with that ass. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to stab Richard fucking Gear. And when I saw him in the city, I was all coked up and I was giving him the evil eye. <laughs> and my friend's like, let it go. And I'm like, this motherfucker he has deserves fucked it. relationships up all over the world. Because women think they're actually going to get Richard Gere. I'm lying to you. The first guy that was going to go down was Donny Osmond. I was going to shoot Donny Osmond. When I was 12, he's the first one that fucked my game up. And then he disappeared for a while, so fuck him. And then Richard Gere showed up. And I was going to beat him the fuck up. <laughs> but then I saw Office and a Gentleman that was pretty good. And I said, I'll give him a pass. Yeah. And by 85, I was okay with Richard Gere. But for four or five years, I was going to fuck Richard Gere up. If you're listening, Richard Gere, you're lucky. <laughs> you no would have never made pretty woman, cocksucker. That's funny. Yeah, I don't know. You just had this hatred, man. If you were in the he hard rock and heavy metal, you were against everything else. Because, uh, you know, so you just, like, too bad. Anybody that liked any kind of rock music. Because you hung out with a different crowd at school. If you came in an ACDC shirt, you hung out with the burnouts and the guys that smoked cigarettes and hung and then the other jocks or whatever didn't like you and looked looked down at you and like fuck you. And if they wore a Springsteen shirt, like you hated them even more. So does it does it annoy you now that if they play like both of the uh, like ACDC and Springsteen on like a classic rock station together, like this isn't the same thing? No, I don't mind it. I, you know, like I said, as we get older, me and Joey just like all right. You know, he's, he had some good songs. I, I don't know what was wrong with me then. Okay, calm down. A it's really bit. crazy. A couple of weeks ago, I I went back to Jersey, and I brought back these strong edibles. And I went out with my brother, and I gave him 100 milligram. I kept telling him there were 50s, but I left the 50s at the house. So now I was stuck for the fucking the thing. So he goes, did you bring it? I gave it to him. And he got fucked up. And I told Lee, and Lee goes, now he's going to get high and eat Domino's pizza. Ah, you can't eat Domino's pizza if you're from my neighborhood. It just isn't allowed. I get that. You wouldn't even be, you just would be ostracized. Do they even have one in your neighborhood? I don't even know. <laughs> Probably, but yeah, the, the, you, but you're, you if would you're 20 not, years old. You would not be talked to. Right. If like you're that's, it, that's it. That's that serious. Of that makes like, sense to me back then. We though. hold our fucking values. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people don't get. It's not just one time. It's a belief. It's a belief. It's like yesterday my, or two days ago, Thursday, my buddy posted on Facebook. And I said, I missed you at Roma's. My friends still go to Roma's Pizza after 40 years, and they wouldn't go anywhere else. And I asked Charlie from Roma's, I go, who still comes here? And he goes, everybody. Even though they live in all parts of Jersey, they stop there once a week to get a slice. That's the loyalty you have, and they don't eat pizza anywhere else. Anywhere else. That's crazy. You know, I went back to Roma and I've refused to eat pizza here. Since I've gone back to Roma, since I've been back yeah. to Jersey, my daughter goes to that pizza parlor. I can't eat. Last week I went and had a meatball sandwich. I don't know why. Like, I'm done. Like, my friends would just would not do anything like that. Like, they would not listen to fucking music that wasn't authorized. Like, that's not even in their fucking brain like it's not even in their brain i don't know how many parties i wasn't went authorized to. I, I, you don't know how many parties i went to and i saw john crowley just break a bruce springsteen out just break it just throw it out of the fucking guys like if it was playing he would just go up and throw it because you knew like if you invited this these people over they weren't going to tolerate that it's just the way that's just the way it is I, I was yeah. doing construction at the time, and a Springsteen song came on the radio. We're putting the roof up or whatever, and as soon as that ra a Springsteen song came on, I would fucking jump off the roof to shut that off. <laughs> That's was, how crazy it was. It was. I would run. If I was in the middle of putting a piece of sheetrock up, I'd fucking stop everything and run to shut that off. That's wild. It was, cra it was crazy how we boycotted things. I still have a personal boycott. <laughs> like, I personally boycott things, and I don't say dick. Like, Tom Hanks. I boycotted Tom Hanks for crying on the Oscars when he won Philadelphia. Really? Like, I didn't watch another one of his movies. It took me 10 years. <laughs> I personally right. banned Tom Hanks from my life. And that's what you have to do sometimes. Like, that's the fucking... The th like, I don't know why. I just get mad sometimes and go, that's it, it's over. Yeah. And I just won't do it no more. Like, I couldn't believe... I got, when I went back for this movie... 
And this, and I tell you this with pain in my heart. I tell you this with pain in my heart because this is how uh, stoic and old school I am. When I went back to New York, the first place I went to was 330 42nd Street to get wardrobe done. Think of the address, I'm telling you. 330 So you're all the way out Street. by like... No, I was a block away from 8th Avenue. Right. So after I got wardrobe, I went out. I go, what am I going to do with my time? And I looked up. And I went for a walk. And I walked down 42nd Street. And I made a left. And I walked up. And if you walk two or three blocks up, there's an olive garden there. And it caught my eye. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, I stood there for 20 minutes <laughs> wishing death on every tourist that walked in there. Because I don't know. I really, I, I really cannot comprehend. Like, that's how stupid I am. But I cannot comprehend how a person goes to New York and goes to a fucking olive garden. Yeah. I do not understand that. It's I amazing. I do not understand. Yeah, and there's a Chevy's across the street from it. There's a Chevy's across the street from it. Yeah. I do not understand how I could go to Long Island <laughs> and get on an elevator with a kid with a Domino's box and his parent right next to him. I can't tell you how much I had to hold back and beating up the parent for letting the kid eat a Domino's when he's in the fucking capital of pizza. Like, you're in the capital of pizza. Like, I can't even comprehend that type of shit. Yeah. Like, even if you're not hungry for a pizza, you got to eat a pizza out of respect for being there. Even though it sounds, I mean, it sounds a little silly when you think about it. Does this sort of, like, strictness help you guys it's in not, your life? In, in other your ways? life. Like, even, this is, this even is though, what it is. Even it's, though Domino's is a silly it's thing. It's the this discipline. Yeah. That's where it starts. It's that discipline of little things. It's the little things that get you to the bigger commitments. So if you start, another dumb thing. There was a, a club named Quintessence when I was growing up. There was a bar named Quintessence in the Ridgefield on the way up. It was sort of like a disco. Right. I went to that parking lot one time. And in the parking lot, we were snorting coke. And I told the driver, it was like four gorillas in the car. And two gorillas had to go in there to pick up chicks. And there was something about the front of that place that I did not like. I did not like the doormen. I didn't like how girls were acting when they were walking in. And I told the driver, let's get the fuck out of here. The kid who was driving. And for a year, I boycotted Quintessence. It was my little power play. When people would come to me and go, you going to Quintessence tonight? I would go, no. And they would <laughs> drop the look on their face. It would be priceless. And I did it on purpose to show people you don't have to go to that dump. <laughs> we're Joe and Mary's type of motherfuckers. We're from a neighborhood bar. We don't go to those places. Like at one age, I decided that I didn't want to go to clubs no more. Rock clubs, I like like the Bubble Factory. What's what was the one about the Soap Factory? Factory? Soap Factory. Soap okay. Factory. Yeah, yeah. The Soap Factory, I kind of dug, but there was a lot of shitheads in there too. Yeah. But I went to see a couple bands in there. Not bad. I walked out of Twisted Sister there, and I saw Aerosmith there. You do know Aerosmith played there? Yeah, because I know at they the played. End, like- yeah, at they, the end, they play like the Found Casino in Jersey on that same run. I saw the them there. End, they were all fucked up. All fucked up. But I used to go, like, I made it a point not to go to Quintessence. Ladies night, whatever. And people would lose their mind. And to this day, people would look at me and go, that's right. You never went to Quintessence. Like, I just refused to go to Quintessence. Do you ever tell any of these people, like, I... Your your band I'm ban- I'm your band from from my life like I'm not gonna go to your bar. No, anymore. I just made a decision. I just make a decision one day that I'm not fucking doing that shit. I'm not. I don't want to be like everybody else and do that shit. And I just don't do it. Smart. Why be like every? Why live your life and be like everybody else? Yeah. Why live your life and have an earring and the goatee and the the cap and try to be <laughs> cool and you know what I'm saying? Like I hate all that. Do you shit. think those people actually think they look good? Like the people who no, dress like they that. think they fit in. They look crazy. I don't. I never really wanted to fit in. If I you guess. if you grew up listening to hard rock and heavy metal, you were not trying to fit in. You were not trying to fit right. in. Absolutely. And to this day, if you like that music, you're not trying to fit in. I, th- I mean, I guess that's good though. Yeah, I never wanted to really be in. I always thought I wanted to be in, but I knew I wasn't what, like reg- like I didn't when I when I when I was a kid, and everybody all the kids in school would say, "Oh, Saturday Night Live." I would look at them and go. I don't know what the fuck you're laughing about. Like, it never made me laugh once. Yeah. So I knew there was something wrong with me already. <laughs> yeah, and then growing up, any popular show, I remember when Friends was popular and whatever. I wouldn't like, watch I wouldn't watch one second of it. I'm like, I I'm wouldn't not watch watching. it. 
I they're like, yeah, Joey it. got a new haircut. I'm like, who? I wouldn't watch it. <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't. Everybody was talking about. It. I'm like, I'll never. I will never watch that I ever. Watch it. You just don't. No, I'm the same way. I didn't watch Game of Thrones. Everyone, everyone goes crazy. For Even it. Star Wars. Everyone was talking about Star. I never I watched. Watch I never, Star Wars. never saw never one second. Star Wars. Never E.T. I never. E.T. I never, never watched, watched that. Indiana. I don't like nothing space <laughs> related. Same with me. <laughs> nothing same, space related. Same with me. Once I see a Martian, you lost me. <laughs> right. I, maybe I, I watched a, a couple of like, Lost in Space as a little kid. I watched a few I like episodes. I Lost in Space as a kid, but I didn't watch Star Trek. I didn't either. I refused to watch fucking Star Trek. As soon as it came on, Batman rolled, <laughs> boom, off Star Trek. I refused to watch all those fucking shows. Crazy. Yep. Same here. It just refused. As comics, though, do you ever feel like you need to watch any of these things or listen just to be able to reference them? Or you just Not talk even, about other things? No. If you're a real comic, I don't know why you're watching anything from 8 to 10 anyway. That's all, yeah. Yeah, if I know. you're a real comedian, before DVD and, and binge watching, I didn't watch TV on legit. First of all, I didn't, I didn't watch TV probably from 86 to when I went to prison. That's when I started watching on Sundays. We'd watch America's Most Wanted in Prison and, uh, <laughs> and Married with Children. That was it. That was it. I'd watch TV on Sunday nights. And then once I started comedy, I didn't watch TV till I moved to L.A. and I started auditioning for TV shows. And that forced me to watch those shows. TV was out of my life. When I, got it, when I first got into comedy, I sold my Sony Trinitron. That was the first thing I did to get the discipline down. I think I sold it for 40 bucks. Wow. That was it. No right. more TV. I don't need TV. Yeah. If I, you're doing comedy, you don't need TV. Yeah, Saturday Night Live, I go, I never watch it. I was always working on Saturday Night If you're a real night. comic, you shouldn't be watching I never, Live. I was never home to watch it on a Saturday, so I didn't know what was going on. Right. That, make, that makes sense. But, I mean, and, and I guess it's also, sometimes I, I, I don't like it. Like, some comics, they have jokes about a song that's out or uh, about a TV show. And I guess some of it's good, but better just to talk about what you like yeah i mean like I, right now you talk about the game of thrones finale which i've never watched any of that either it's like there's going to be six other comics on the show that are probably going to have a joke about that so why would right. i want to go okay well, I, I need to know about that because everyone's talking about it okay i think it goes back for me because i was thinking about this for me it was more like when you see a fucking mexican dude mowing the lawn <laughs> right go up to him and ask him if he knows what Game of Thrones is. Ask him if he gives a fuck about Archie, the kid from England, the fucking ugly fucking kid that was born to the Prince of England and, and uh, Malin, whatever her fuck, right. Megan, whatever, yeah. Markley, whatever her fucking name is. Ask him if they went to see the Avengers. They don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about that. Like, And that's what immigrant mentality is. They don't have time for stupidity. You know, I grew up, I was very ashamed this last time about New York because when I was raised in New York City, the first thing your mom told you when you walked the streets was look straight ahead and don't fuck around. I can't believe how many New Yorkers I saw looking at their fucking phone. I wish I could smack them all with one hand. <laughs> this is the worst fucking thing going in the world right now. This takes people's attention. This takes your fucking time. This is why when I go on the road, I don't bring social media with me. Once I'm on the road Thursday, there's no social media with me. I have Twitter on this phone, but no Facebook. Yeah. I got my emergency fucking email. But that's it, because I've seen what it's done to people. People are fucking done with social media. It went from posting one thing to posting psychological problems now. <laughs> social media is at an all-time fucking low. And it's not social media's fault. It's our fault for letting ourselves get caught up. You know what I'm saying? I use it to, to promote dates and to keep in touch with the fan base from the from the church. I don't use it to tell fucking people my problems or... Or, uh, or, your, it, or your politics. It, yeah, or it's gone kind of... somewhere completely fucking different. Well, I, th I think it's just people... That's where they're living their lives now. Like, a lot of people on... Like... Whenever I'm on a diet, I, I, do, I watch people... I, watch, I look for food videos on YouTube... And there's a new thing now where people are eating like ten cheeseburgers on like it's called they call it like a mukbang like they eat like a whole stack of food and they have like millions of views and, and people are just living their entire lives on the computer now. 
If you're if you don't go online for five days and you go back on, you didn't miss one thing. You didn't miss one. Thing. You didn't miss one thing. You didn't miss one thing. Twenty. They said twenty percent of people are on Twitter in the whole world, and only ten percent actually engage with people. So eighty percent. I have seventeen people in my family, and three of them are on Twitter, and none of them post anything. They just follow whatever news organizations to see what's going on. Most of the people have no. My friend got some Twitter beef with another comic. I go. You realize two thousand people know what's going on in this whole world. Right. I go, no one knows what the fuck's going on. I go, don't play to that 2,000 people. But it, I, Do you think that it's on everyone's radar? It's not. Who gives a shit? Because we're all on it every day, or a lot. What kills me the most about this thing that we're going through right now with social media is, <laughs> like, I had to say something to somebody a couple of weeks ago. I really like this girl. She's come to a couple of shows and stuff. And she emails me once every 10 days about Thailand and how beautiful it is. And one Saturday, I just checked Twitter, and she had 20 fucking tweets in a row. There's two people that I don't know how they're living their lives. You know, people always go, oh, Joey, you got some outlandish fucking stories. Because I'm not, I wasn't raised on the fucking television or raised on a phone. I was raised on the street. I was raised living life experiences. Not reading about somebody doing mushrooms or reading about, so I lived it. You know what I'm saying? Like I lived it. I never had to read about it and then go do it to to try to be cool. Like I, I didn't know anything about that. I lived for now. Like and I still live for now. I feel bad when I see people constantly, and you see them constantly all day. Yeah. All you gotta do is look at the thread and see what you missed for six hours, and you're like, this person has not stopped. You go to a fucking concert, what do you see? People with their phones up, taping. Why are you taping? What are you taping? What is it gonna do for you? <laughs> to show somebody at work? Why are you taping? <laughs> right. Why are you taping? You're not watching. You're not getting the full fucking experience. You're not fucking getting the full experience of what life is throwing at you. Put that fucking, this is the worst thing that they could have created for us. Yeah. This is the worst thing. It simplifies people. Nobody, you know, like, I just stop with the text. Like, if you text me, you might as well shoot yourself. You're not going to get nowhere. Like, don't text me because you're not going to get nowhere. It's over. I disconnected the fucking thing. It's over. Like, I get certain fucking, it's over. Like, every day I shed more and more of the phone or social media. Like, I'm down to Thursdays now. Right. Like, I used to fuck around on Fridays. I eliminated Fridays because it's taking too much time. I noticed that it was taken, and it's not me. I see what it's doing to people. You're killing your life. You're not living your life. You're, you're looking at something, and then you look down to post something stupid, yeah. like something that has no value in our world or in your life at all. You know, the other night I went somewhere to eat, and I was like, maybe I should take a picture. And I go, no. Why am I doing what everybody else does? Forget this shit. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's it. I, I was trying to do a few weeks ago something on Instagram. The picture wouldn't fit, and I'm trying to shrink it down. I'm telling my friend to go, How do, and I'm like, "What the fuck am I? I just wasted 25, 25 minutes, minutes to try to shrink it because it doesn't fit on Instagram." I'm like, what am I doing in my life? Who gives a fuck if I post this or not? Are are kids getting phones? Like, I, I didn't get a phone until I was in middle school, and that way it was just a brick phone, like the Nokia old ones. Are kids, young kids, like? elementary school getting phones now my kid's know. eight he's gonna be nine he doesn't even it's no he's not getting a phone for a while he's not even asking for one really i thought i figured they'd be asking f by like four or five no he doesn't his uh cousin who's a couple years older than him he's got the phone and now they have like their relate it's affected their relationship because whenever they see each other he's just looking at the phone playing a game and my son's just sitting next to him going hey hey you know wanting to talk to him but he's just buried in the phone yeah, no, I would be if I was a kid. I forced my daughter out of the house every day. Today it started drizzling. I still forced her out. I walked into the park myself for an hour and a half. I force her out. So there's no, I want her to live the same. You know, I was talking to my wife last night about going to that fucking school where she goes to school at and saying that I want the kids to put together like a school newspaper. So they have to deliver papers. Each kid has to deliver a paper on their block. And you get the kids writing and going out. I think that a lot of people don't have that. I've noticed that a lot of the people that come on the podcast, the sharper people have a paper route. 
I noticed that kids that had a paper route are sharper fucking kids because they had that that contact with humans at yeah. a younger age. You know how to wheel and deal. One thing I noticed the last month especially is that adults are not slick anymore. What's that? You ever see that movie, The Town? The Town. Yeah, with Ben Affleck. Ben yeah. Affleck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he tells the cop next time, don't take pictures down the corner from my house. Be slicker than a fifth grader or whatever. He said slicker than whatever. This country has forgotten how to be slick. I see it from dealing with people. Dealing with people. People aren't slick no more. They're not slick. My five, my six-year-old is slicker than most adults today. They don't know how to fit nothing in. They don't know how to wheel and deal. They don't know the counter. You know, like when I was a kid and I come to your door, do you want the Sunday paper? No. I use that I use that paper route to sell all my shit. Like if I was a CYO basketball player, all right, if you don't want the Sunday paper, you're buying a fucking sticker. Right. And if you're not buying a sticker, <laughs> yeah. you're buying something from me. And I'm going to torment you every day until you buy something from me. And when I realize you're not going to buy something from me, I'll put you on a list. And on Halloween, when we throw eggs, yep. your house is going to get bombarded to Mission. the fuck. Yep. So you work people. You understood how to work people. I want my daughters to have that same thing, how to work people. And that's how you learn all this shit. So I'm going to that fucking school to pitch them for her first grade that all those get five or six first graders and give them extra credit. Make them right, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders. Even if I have to walk down the block with her to deliver those papers yeah. and to ask for the quarter, whatever the fuck it is, because we're missing out. We're missing out. I, I see kids missing out on a lot of things that I had growing up that I, I'm happy I didn't miss out on them. Paper routes, working, you know, uh, when it snowed, fucking shoveling people out. I used to make 100 bucks every time it Easily. fucking snowed. Absolutely, 100, snowed, 150. I took a yard stick out. Fucking a shovel, me and my buddies. You want a drink tonight? You want to smoke pot? Let's do We would go and out. Knock there, on every door. Knock on doors. Knock 20 bucks, 25 bucks, 30. We have forgotten that. We that is These are unknown secrets. And people, when they hear this, they go, oh, I never thought of that. Because you're not slick. We've lost that gift. It's like I was telling you before the podcast started. And we'll call my buddy Mike Duffy right now. Mike Duffy was the leader of that shit. I didn't even come up with it. I told you, in 1976... For the uh, the two hundredth anniversary of the fucking whatever, we were down there walking around and we saw a parking lot that was empty and the restaurant was closed, so we went. We borrowed a fucking bolt cutter from a cop. Like we went up to a cop and said, "Can we borrow a bolt cutter?" He's like, "For what?" He's like, "Ah, somebody tied my bicycle." The cop was looking at the Hudson River. We went and cut the the fucking <laughs> chain, and we charged four dollars to park. Is it legal? No, it's not legal. But it's kids being slick. It's just kids being slick. And if you start at that age, how to flip a fucking buck when you get older, you know how to be fucking slick. Kids today that have no paper out, they got no quaaludes, they got no hits of acid. Yep. You have no way to learn about business at a young age, 13 and 14. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you the yeah. honest to God truth. You don't understand the value of a dollar, how to buy something for $2 and sell it for 4 whatever the fuck it is. When I was a kid, I sold everything. I remember I remember getting on a plane one time with my mother and stepfather going to Puerto Rico. And in first class, they used to give you shampoos and hand creams. And me sitting there going, I'm going to take, I took a puke bag and I put all the perfumes because I would sell them on Broadway. Right. Like, I was that much of a fucking mensch when I was a fucking kid. When I was shooting that movie in Jersey, we had to shoot in a banquet hall. And I was sitting in one of those Hollywood chairs. And I was looking up, and they had chandeliers, and they were like little gems. And I remember being a kid, going somewhere and stealing the fucking gems off the chandelier, thinking they were diamonds, and selling them on Broadway. And people telling me to get the fuck out of there. It was the heart that mattered. I was still, I always was a wheeler dealer. I don't know if you get that from being from Jersey. I don't know what the fuck. When I moved to Jersey, those kids made a mint. They stole something every day. The common denominator, we would go to Sea Caucus and cut punks. Those things that you light on fire in yeah, your yeah. backyard Punk, yeah. to kill the mosquitoes. I mean, we even went that far. We always were looking to make a dollar every fucking day. We did something. Did it, did it slow down for you? Because when I was younger, I did that. But then when I got like a, re a job at like 15, 14, 
Like it's it, it it's it was hard for me to ask for money as an adult. Like it's we're not asking, we're taking. You just take it. There was know. a soccer field when I was growing up, Schutzen Park, a German fucking hall, and they had people who you could see eight thousand a thousand people in the soccer field, and it was covered by sheet metal. We figured out that every sheet of sheet metal we get a hundred and forty dollars. You don't know how many nights we were on top of that roof, <laughs> taking a piece of sheet metal off, carrying it down the woods, and walking it to the fucking sheet metal yard, and getting one hundred forty dollars and splitting it three ways, and then taking two sheets down, taking three sheets down, and you, people at home are listening, going, "Jesus Christ, Joey, did you guys ever stop?" No, no, no. I still remember being a car salesman, making ten thousand a month, and at lunchtime I would walk into the Boulder Mall. And steal cross pens. When it wasn't payday, <laughs> I would ask the lady, "Can I see those pens?" And she would open up the thing and walk away. And I would take a handful of cross pens and sell them to salesmen for twenty dollars a piece. Jeez. It never ended. Like it never. That mentality never. Ended. Like I was always wheeling and dealing. You had to. Those record clubs, those Columbia House, BMG, oh. thirteen C albums for a penny. So oh. we, so we did all, all these different names. They'd come to our address, and you know, you don't put a social security number, so they never messed up your credit. And then we'd go to this place called the English Town Auction on Saturday and Sunday, and just get a table. We we wouldn't pay for the table. You're supposed to pay like fifty bucks to rent the table or thirty, whatever it was. And we just sit there, all the albums that we got, and we'd sell them. So we paid a penny. We just pay. pay you just take the penny. So and 10 put it cents in for 100 albums? Yeah, you know, get 13 albums 13 for, a penny. for a penny. And then you had to buy them later on, and then you just blew it off. You didn't buy them. They would send <laughs> you didn't another. buy shit. Yeah, they'd send a new U2 record. It was the record a month. They go, okay, good, I got this now. And they go, we need 1386 from you. Just blow Fuck it off. You. Burn the, burn those bills. Or just, if, if a friend got a new apartment, we'd just get that address. What's your new address? And then we just forward all those bills there, and he'd get like 40 bills a day. <laughs> and we'd just sell them at the English Town Auction for like five bucks. And we'd walk away with $70. Fucking yeah. Columbia House, they were in Terre Haute, Indiana. Yeah, Terre Haute, Haute yeah. Indiana. I knew them that address by heart. And yep. I would just take my magazines and I would fill out Columbia House, mail them to the house across the street, mm -hmm. and you'd wait for fucking the mailman to you come. See the big the, box come. You yep. See the big box. You run <laughs> up the stairs and take the box, and then you'd have duplicate out. And all the albums were a farce anyway. They were all duplicates. Yeah, they weren't. They, they, weren't, they weren't great. They, they were really, really thin. They weren't really the original albums. They yeah. would just make copies, and that's why you got 13 of them for a penny, and then you had to agree to buy four of them over the next three years Yeah, for like twenty eight ninety nine. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Which is ridiculous. That's how they made their money back. Whenever they changed formats from album to cassette to CD, I would go, go okay, I need all the Black St Sabbath stuff now in a cassette. Now I need it in a CD, and I would just get it through Columbia House. I'm like, fuck it. I already paid for it once. I'm not paying for it again. I actually wrote a... I wrote, I actually wrote a check to Columbia House back in like 2004 when I started making money in comedy, and I sent him a check for two grand. I said, "Just cash it." I, I, you know, ripped you guys off for years or whatever. Just cash it because I felt bad, it? huh? Did they cash? They did. Yeah, I never. I did. I cashed it. Did they ever mail you a thank you? No, did nothing. I didn't hear back from. Fuck I, those motherfuckers. But I, See, okay, you I, made me feel guilty. I, I almost wrote them a check, but if they're not gonna say thank you, no, they didn't say thank <laughs> you. They go fuck and themselves. Believe me, I ripped them off for probably five grand. Jesus. Oh, I got them too. I got there was them. another company called Finger Hut where they'd have like these little CD players or whatever, or clock radios, all these little gadgets, and that was the same thing. You know, you can get it for free, and then you just have to buy stuff. So me and my brother, around Christmas time, we get presents for our family, like a CD player and shit like that, and we just and we just blow them off and never acknowledge them again. They'd be chasing us. So down they had these great catalogs, a little like shit. It was almost like sharper in image, right? But shittier stuff. Okay. Like a shittier version of sharper. And they would image. send you shit with no money. No money. They would send you one thing with no money, and then you had to buy like four other things. Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> It's amazing where they like how long did columbia house last what, what, they're still around. Year, yeah they're still basically around but it, years i mean I'm, I'm like how does this company stay in business because i don't know anyone that paid them i don't know one person that ever paid them i tried to do it my brother was ripping them off so much i go you know what i should really just do it i'm making a little money now i'm gonna i put it in my real name and they turned me down i'm like you motherfuckers so then i just put it in dan marino's name so i was a dan marino fan i got 13 <laughs> fucking metallica records the next day how crazy is that? I'm like, really? In my own name and you're going to turn me down? I started fucking with Columbia House when I was in Catholic school. Somebody told me, yeah, just send it in. I was like, are you serious? Yeah. And I started, I think I got like American Pie. Right. Don McLean. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the first albums I got. Uh, Superfly. 
I got from Columbia House. I got all those albums from Columbia House the first time. Then they'd send you letters, and I'd just throw them away. Then I figured just out, wait a second. Garbage. Let me send an account to my mother. And they took it. <laughs> then I sent one to my stepfather. And then I just started putting fake ad- uh, fake names and sending them to my address, and they would still send them. Same one. You, you could use the address like 15 times with 15 different names. You just make up a name, and That's they would it. keep sending them. People across the street, the Tristanos, right. they had two girls. How many <laughs> things I sent to their house? Right. <laughs> I sent pornos to their house because we used to get Super 8s. When Super 8, and I told that bit for years about people didn't know that before YouTube or U-Hub or Pornhub and all that shit. If you wanted to get porn, you had to order it in the mail. When I was like 10, 11, you had to get porno in the mail. So you had to, and it didn't even go to like, uh, it wasn't even Playboy or Hustler. It was like regular magazines. You'd go to the back and they'd have three pornos for nineteen ninety five, And if you order now, you get a projector. So they would send you this little mini Super 8 projector. It was called Reel to Reel or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And you had to put it in, and you had to put a sheet up, and the pornos were just god awful. Like the reason why I don't watch porn today is because of those pornos from the seventies. Whatever they sent you in the mail, what, the, all those women are dead. Like all those women got killed. They they did not survive. They were lied to. They picked them up in a van. You could see, it. like they were crack hoes even before there was crack. <laughs> Like it was that bad, the pornos. You could get pornos in the mail. So I don't remember do that. that. I don't huh? remember that. I would have definitely have done that. I, I don't. Me and my friends did it. I think one time, and that right. was all it took. Yeah, like it scared the, the shit out of us. Like we, we went into an area that you weren't supposed to go in. Yeah, it was me, Sabatino, the Special Brothers, and I think one of the Balzanos, and we all chipped in five bucks. Because it was like nineteen ninety nine plus shipping and handling, and you had to wait six weeks for them to process it. It was just like getting a ticket in the seventies. Like if you wanted to go see the Who, like who were you in seventy six? We had to send uh, Pink Floyd. Also, Pink Floyd the Wall, well, not Pink Floyd the Wall. I'm sorry, there was somebody else that PLJ in the old days. You yeah. had to mail a fucking a check or a money order in to PLJ. And then they would send you tickets back. They would send you a letter with four tickets. You only were allowed to get four tickets. You didn't know that, Jim? Yeah, no, I did you remember. remember that? Yeah, you couldn't get too many. They you wanted get from the many. scalpers. They didn't want the scalpers right. so buying it was 20 four tickets. tickets. So let's say Judas Priest was doing five nights at the Palladium. You would order, Lee would order, I would order, Keisha would order five. So five of us would order five t- four tickets. And if you went, then we would go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And usually if you mailed it in, you got them. Yeah. Unless you mailed it in two weeks late and you didn't get shit. Okay. But if you mailed it, PLJ said tomorrow at 8 a.m., if you mailed it that day, you usually got tickets, especially at the Garden. Yes did that. Yes came every September five or six nights. You had to mail shit in to get it back. But porno, when I first, the first time I saw porno, it was porno that you had to order in the mail. And I still remember... Wait the six weeks for it and fucking getting it and it being like a secret fucking party, like handshakes and people came over. We had we had to do it in my house up in the attic and it was hot and we had to bring a fan and an air conditioner. Yeah, <laughs> like that's how crazy that shit was. Yeah, man. Um, I think I lit those pawns on fire. We melted them. <laughs> that's how disgusting they were. They were that fucking disgusting. That's like just, funny. Like, we thought we were going to see, like, models and shit. Uh-uh. It looked like women that had been run over, and they smuggled them down the hotel <laughs> or some shit. It was bad. It was really fucking bad. Damn. Yeah, because, I mean, you just basically had a magazine. What we do with the Columbia House stuff, if we, you know, got it shipped to our address, there was, I remember there was one kid in the neighborhood we all hated. He was a dick, so we just forward over to his address. <laughs> Because you would you get the bill and you would forward out a change of address and just put his address, so now all the bills would go to his house. And he didn't know who it was coming from because I put Dan Marino down, so he had no idea it wasn't my name. So he had no idea where the shit was coming, and he just get stacks of bills. Fuck him. When I was home this time too, I remembered something. You know, I remember he used to bring the coke up to Dan Marino at the University of Pittsburgh. I knew those guys. Oh yeah. They're yeah, well, that's. Around. I'm it's, telling you, that's why he dropped all the way to Dolphins at, at 
picked 24 that year because there was always rumors that he was doing coke in college because he was going to be like number one and five quarterbacks went before him or four. Kenny O'Brien, all these guys because of the coke rumors and the Dolphins go, we'll take a chance on him. Fuck it. He's down in Miami anyway. I didn't know you were that much of a damn Oh, Marino huge. Fan. Yeah, huge. Dolphin fan and Marino fan. I wound up being get, get to know him because I worked on Inside the NFL like in 2004 and he was on there. And shit, so we became friends and stuff. I still see him from time to time. He's a great dude. That guy, after like inside the NFL, Bob Casas, Chris Collinsworth, Chris Carter, oh, they'd do like a party or something like that afterwards. They'd all go sit at the table, like, you know, the hosts and stuff like that with all the executives from HBO. Marino would hang with the friggin' camera guys and drink beers with them and just cr- tell stories. He wanted to hang with the blue collar guys. He was always like that. Growing up from Pittsburgh. He's a Pittsburgh guy. Yeah, yeah. Pittsburgh guy, yeah. I'll never forget when Pittsburgh played West Virginia. Marino senior year. And there was a guy on West Virginia called Daryl Talley. Oh, yeah. He went to the Bills. He ended up playing yeah, for the Bills. He's an Spider-Man. animal. Yeah. You should have seen him in college. Really? Like in college, I was like, who is this fucking guy? He was doing everything. He had the face paint. The yeah, number 56. He was in the tackling boat. people, sacking people, biting people, <laughs> fucking intercepting balls. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Still remember Marino. That was on a couple of weeks ago. The the quarterback thing. 30 for 30. With oh, Elway. yeah, with, with Elway and Marino, Breaking yeah. It down fucking brilliant what the Yankees did with Elway. Elway just did not want to play for the fucking Colts. He's like, I'm not doing it. Yeah. I'm not fucking doing it. Yeah, that was amazing. You know, and uh, yeah, he had a great senior, uh, junior year, and then Marino felt, uh, didn't have a great senior year, and there was drug rumors about him, and he dropped all the way, and Miami picked him up. I still remember kids telling me they were going to Pitt to party. Not saying his name, like he wasn't a big deal at the time. But I still remember a handful of kids, a girl specifically, that she was dating one of those guys that was coming to Hudson County, picking up the shit in North Bergen and bringing it right up to Pitt for the weekends because the kid went to St. Joe's in West New York. Right. There was a kid from St. Joe's, West New York, that went to Pitt, and he played in Pitt all four years with Marino. He was the fucking source of that, of that fucking powder, poor Marino, and he was still on powder in the NFL too, supposedly. Yeah, I mean, if he lived in Miami and stuff, you know, he never got caught or anything. I don't know. No, no, but, no, he no. Never. The the receivers did. The Duper and Clayton. Yeah, all those, those guys. Motherfuckers were snorting like it was the fourth. Oh yeah, run. yeah. They got they got busted, and even later on in life, like Duper was dealing and stuff like that. All those Miami guys. There was always these former Dolphins. Mercury Morris was the original one. Got caught with coke back in the seventies. It was in jail for like five years. Mercury really? Morris. Yeah. Do you yeah, dealing. Have, I don't know. I don't know your history, Jim. I don't know if you did coke or anything like that. But I always think about like, could you be a, like a musician on tour or like an athlete who's playing games and have like a like? It seems like it would take too much out of you to have a problem like that, but still be able to go out there and perform at like the, that crazy level. No, there was guys in the seventies, a, a bunch of baseball players, like ten baseball players, stars, got busted for doing coke. Pittsburgh going to games. Pirates. Yeah, and then Keith Hernandez Keith was involved, Hernandez, and Dave the Parker. Man. What was Ron, it? Uh, Candelaria. Candelaria. John Candelaria, the Candyman, Lawrence Taylor, bands, shit. I saw Lawrence Taylor in a strip club. It's, it's, it was Saturday night at like 2 a.m., and he had a game Sunday at 1 p.m. in Jersey. Jesus. He was fucking hanging out with strippers, fucking dr- guzzling drinks back. And he had a game in, what, 11 hours. <coughs> They're just that good, I guess. They're just that good. They could perform under that type of... They could just perform. I guess so. You know, I did it for years. I didn't get high and go on stage. But... But I, you've talked about how, like, if you got high too high, like, sometimes your sets wouldn't be as Oh, good. no, you have no contact. You have no emotion behind your material. It's just words on a paper. All those guys that got fucked up, and I work with a lot of them when I first started... If they ever had a second show on a weekend, they were terrible. The first show, they were pretty good because they were just in a groove and they had a nice buzz on. By the second show, you have to wait an hour between the second show start. By the time they went back on, they were terrible. 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 Yeah, it just doesn't work. Yeah. It makes sense. You can't be that fucked up for like seven hours. You know, you start the first show starts at eight. You're not you're getting off stage at twelve thirty or whatever, five and a half hours. It just doesn't work. And there's too much downtime in between. And then they get more fucked up. Probably. You're more fucked up, and then they're, you know, maybe doing some coke to get back up, and then drinking a ton and all that. It's just never. And I always saw that going. I go, I'm not going to do it. I'm never going to do that. 
I mean, I never did coke anyway, but I'm never going to be fucked up because I can see how much it affects the show. I got into comedy in June of 91 and then St. Patty's Day at 92. I bought some coke and I go, I'm going to do some coke before I go on stage. I thought Richard Pryor did it. I thought he did it and go on stage. And it was such a disaster. And never again. I would do it right from the stage to the bathroom. But I would never go up on stage with it. Never. And it would make... I saw the difference it made when I got high the night before and went on stage the next day. I would go on stage for four nights and just bomb because I was getting high the night before. And I could feel it. And then when I had a big show, I wouldn't get high for like a day before it. So I would be clean for like 24, 48 hours if I had a serious show. But I always got high after a show. Jesus. And that's why I never got nowhere. It wasn't until I... Yeah, it really, uh, fucks you. It really affects you if you get really fucked you. up the, the night before and you got shows the next day. Your you. sleep's off and everything like that. You're exhausted on stage. You're just not right. thinking straight. Which is why it's not for the athletes. Like you hear about John Jones talking about he was doing coke all before those DC fights. I guess they're just so, like, they're just machines, I guess. Well, you have that muscle memory. You know, I heard Lawrence Taylor was snorting coke. It bothered me when people would say, well, the reason why Lawrence Taylor is so good is because he snorts coke. That's bullshit. That's completely bullshit. Because I remember being locked up, and we would do speed on Mondays. And Monday nights, we would all be allowed to go to a, a grammar school, like a mile away from the fucking prison and play basketball. And I would be a mess. I would be a fucking mess. I would, and that was speed. I can't imagine doing like coke. I, my heart would be everywhere. My breathing would be off. My timing would be off. And I was a young kid, and I just felt it. Then I'm like, nah, I don't think this works. If you get high and do what you're supposed to do, listen. I'm sure that there's a thousand comics that have done coke and gone on stage and done great. It just didn't work for me. Because then you get in the habit of you have to do it all the time. Right. You feel like it's all superstitions. Oh, man, I kill with it. So now I got to do it every night. You're doing five, six nights a week. You're going to be fucking dead in 10 years. Yeah. People always give me shit like, you don't drink? I go, I go, I do this five, six nights a week. I've been doing it for 28, 29 years. I go, I have no liver left. If I'm, I need to have beers before I go on stage. Yeah. Every night. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I, I would never get into that habit of doing that. And then I got to drive. I'm like, fuck that. I'm, you know. That's the I thing take that petrifies me the most. I can't keep it together if I drink and drive. I cannot keep it together. I'm not a big drinker, but if I have a half a beer and I get in the car, my heart rate's fucking pumping. And I got because I have no credibility. Once you have alcohol on your breath and you get pulled over by a cop, you have zero credibility. Even if it's even if you just had a little bit of beer with your meal, you have no credibility. You have nowhere to come from because once he asks you if you've been drinking. You got to say yes, and you got to take that fucking test. So I'd rather not drink and do 90 and take a chance. You know how many times a cop pulled me over and I was speeding over the speed? Weren't you in a car with me? And I just got pulled over for doing 80, and we didn't get a ticket. Oh, it's not a thing. Yeah, because right? gen I'm a gentleman, A, and B, I don't have alcohol on my breath. Right. You could prove your point a lot more when you don't have alcohol and your car don't smell like reefer. And I knew this 30 years ago. Like when I would read that somebody got pulled over and they had a roach in the car and they had three kilos of coke, if I was a judge, I'd give them additional time yep. <laughs> for felony stupid. Like I would have that charge, felony stupid. Like I would have that charge. If I have anything in my car, and if I have more than two joints in my car, I don't do over the speed limit. They gave us a right in California. They gave us the right to smoke pot whenever we wanted to. Do you really need to smoke pot in your car? No. If you do, you're a fucking idiot. Right, yeah. You're a fucking idiot. You know, do you really need to smoke pot in your car? Not really. California gave you a fucking chance to smoke all the pot you want in your fucking house or on your balcony. You don't need to smoke in the car. And you're going to lose your license. You're going to crash, and they're going to trace it to that. You're going to get fucking sued. And the whole, you know. And if, God, if God yeah. forbid you kill someone, some yeah. guy's walking across the street, you don't see him, whether even if you were sober. And he did it, and you, you're high, forget it. You're going to jail minimum of 10 years. Yeah, the, that happened Over to like, Dante Stallworth a couple of years ago. Yeah. He just hit some guy who was walking across the floor. That's, that's like my nightmare. Just no, a it's, if my you action. pay a fucking attention to life, if you pay attention, 
you'll save. You eliminate 20% of the bad shit that could happen. What's pay attention mean? Who gives a fuck who's calling you? Right. When you're in a fucking car and I'm driving and somebody calls you, it tells me who's calling me. I don't need to pick it up. I don't need to text when I'm driving. I don't want to text when I'm fucking driving. I don't want to text at all. So that's why I don't pay attention to it. If you pay attention to life, you won't have those problems. Even when I was in my deepest drug comas, I always paid attention. I, I can't tell you how many times I tell my daughter to pay attention. And she does now. She walks with her head up. Yeah, know your Walk, surroundings. Know your fucking surroundings. I always ask her, who's in the room? Like the other day, I, I said to her, look behind you. You know, and I te see, when you fucking walked up to me, you should have made sure that guy was there. You didn't because you didn't look. You got to look around. You got to keep your eyes open at all times. When I see stupid shit on the news, it breaks my heart, especially as a parent at the park. When I go to the park, I see parents fucking turn their backs and shit. You don't ever turn your back on your kid. Your eyes are always on your kid. If somebody talks to you and they're over here and it forces you, I stop the conversation. I stop the fucking conversation. I want to watch what the fuck is going on. At it's all important. times. At all fucking times. Yeah. I live a little off a, a road where the speed limit is like 35 miles an hour. I'm like a corner house. And my my son and his friends are always playing in my yard. They're playing baseball, whatever. And I always tell them, I said, listen, if that ball ever goes in that road, under no circumstances, go get it. I go, I got 17 more balls in the house. Don't ever think you can go get that ball real quick and then run off. You're not. So they just know. I go, don't ever go over this fence. You know what I mean? So they, I just put it in. I tell them every time they play. I go, you guys know what the rule is if that ball goes over there? Yeah, we don't go get it. Exactly. Even if it's the last one left. So you just got to let them know, man. Don't ever. On the, you know, I, I can make it. Notice, you know, so they know. It's funny. You used to go to an English, English town Jersey. auction. I live near there still. I, st I bring my son there. There's, there's so much stolen shit there every week. Everything is. <laughs> it's great. 90% of this shit at that English town flea market. <laughs> With the mini, what is it? The mini car, English Town. They got the, the Raceway Park. The Raceway is with the funny still cars. There? Yeah, it's still there. They're trying to outlaw because it, it allowed noises in the summer. I love it. I sit on my deck. I hear those race, those drag racing cars. I'm I like, this is cool. Believe <laughs> yeah. they still have. Those they still have them. Cars. But I used to go to that thing in 19 like 76, and we used to sell sneakers. Yeah, Converse limousines for the feet. <laughs> everything down there was stolen. Everything. Car speakers, everything just fell off a fucking truck. It was just an outlet to sell stolen stuff. Watches, you go down there and look at somebody and give them like a look, mm -hmm. like a <laughs> wink, and they'll take you for a walk. Like, is this all you have? And they look at you for a couple minutes, and you look at them. They look at you, and they're like, let's take a walk. And you go to their car, and they got tons of shit in that car. Grenades, <laughs> fucking dead bodies. English Town, New Jersey was the shit. It was unbelievable. We used to buy used sneakers there for like ten bucks, like used high tops. Cartons like all right, cigarettes, carton cigarettes, and, and then fireworks like M eighties yeah. and blockbusters. A guy in a corner would have a table out, like he'd have a cover over it, and you walk by, like yeah, I got fireworks. Like he wouldn't couldn't keep them out in the open. Mats of firecrackers, and you'd buy shit right there, like you know, a quarter stick of dynamite for like six bucks. <sighs> A blockbuster was a quarter stick of dynamite, and we'd just blow people's mailboxes up in the neighborhood that we didn't like. We'd just set it, and then there'd just be a stick there, and you wouldn't even know where the mailbox went. They'd sell dynamite to, like... Yeah, they didn't give a shit. Yeah, they don't yeah, we give were a fuck. Fourteen, fourteen. We we take. They don't the, give a fuck. We would take. Me and my friends would take the train into the city and go into Chinatown and go to I don't know some shady apartment, and we'd st we'd be stealing the fireworks at the same time. We'd distract a woman that's going to sell us, and we'd be shoving them down our pants, blockbusters, and come back with all these fireworks and just go go, go sell them in the neighborhood and everybody else. Because there was a car. There was a guy that came off from Chinatown close to the Fourth of July, that would sell fireworks out of his car. In the summertime, right before the 4th of July. Then we got hit. We found out <laughs> that you could undercut that motherfucker just by going to Chinatown yourself. Yeah. We were kids. Eighth grade, seventh grade. We would go to Chinatown and buy those things. We'd buy a, a gross of bottle rockers. Bottle rockers. 144, 144 bottle rockers. 144 <laughs> yeah. bottle rockets. A gross and shit. We'd buy, and we'd light up the whole mat. Like We'd get the mats. <laughs> 
Yep, matter of fireworks. I forget how many firecrackers were in there. No fucking idea. It's amazing you're still alive. Like 150 packs of firecrackers. And have all your fingers and, oh my God. I remember the cops would come around a week before the 4th of July and show you pictures of people's hands that have been blown up. Yeah, it worked yeah. on me. And we tell them to go fuck themselves. Yeah, like, who cares? That's oh, like I'm, an still, I'm still scared of fireworks. We used to have firecracker fights. Like, we'd light firecrackers. And throw them at each and other. And throw them at each other. Oh, my God. And, and then sometimes- we take the stick off the fire. You take a stick off a bottle rocket, you right. light on fire, it's a nigger chaser. Because it would just spin <laughs> yep. around and go just crazy. Right. So they would call them nigger chasers. Yep. Even the Chinese people go, you buy nigger chaser. And we yep. would look at them like, what the fuck are you talking about? What did the black people call it? Uh, don't, they wouldn't. <laughs> they never mess with fireworks. You couldn't bring those things. Listen, black people don't mess around with fireworks or cryotherapy. <laughs> well known. You'll never see a brother in a cryotherapy fucking thing. Oh my god! Fucking so hilarious. Weird. What they and it got cra- the thing about Chinatown is that every time and I'm talking about the one in New York. I don't know one about San Francisco or in L.A. And I'm talking about the the mid seventies that every, they'd be like little dealers on the corner, and again they would sell you the the, the you know firework uh, firecrackers, bottle rockets. Smoke bombs, and cherry bombs. Cherry bombs was the general. They yeah, two cherry bombs make an M eighty, right? There was a formula. Yeah, yeah. Four four cherry bombs make them an M eighty, and four M eighties is a quarter stick of dynamite. Good to know. So we'd fucking buy twenty M eighties, <laughs> and fucking, I mean, the <laughs> things we did with those M eighties, we blew holes in walls. Just tied them together, and then there was always one kid who knew how to fucking put everything together. Ooh. He was missing a finger. Yeah. There was a kid on 148th Street that for like $10, he would hold on to shit and let it blow up on his <laughs> hand and stuff. <laughs> Hilarious. He was missing fingernails. He had gotten his fingernail blown off one year from a fire. <laughs> <laughs> was, that your, was that your $10? Not really. I just couldn't believe that he would hold fireworks. Like he was like a Vietnam vet or something. And he would let things blow up in his hands. <laughs> fucking. Cherry bombs, M80s, and you had something stronger than the M80s. The Blockbuster. The Blockbuster. Blockbuster was actually a quarter stick of dynamite. Jesus. And then you had the, what's the thing that shot the balls that you shot people with? A rocket launcher? Like a little rocket. They called them something. Oh. You lit the top and balls came out. Oh, yeah. Candle Fireballs. Roman, Roman candle. candle. Roman candles. Roman candle. Roman candles. We'd light you on fire with a Roman candle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every year, we get a Roman candle. Like, if we hated you, if you didn't tip yeah. or give money or give keep the kids good, we would burn your roof with Roman <laughs> fucking candles. You know how many fucking roofs we burned on Charles Court and giving our terrace in 38th Street? Because we wouldn't stop with the Roman candles till we lit your roof on fire. Listening to you guys makes me not want to have kids. Like it just scares no, me. No, like, this is what it is to be a kid. Yeah. We, oh my god. We shot some bottle rockets into a field and it would start it on fire. <laughs> a fire, on fire. The, yeah. They had to call the fire department and put it out because it was it was in August or July. It was hot and it just yeah. lit right up. That's what fields do. Oh my we god. We would make gasoline bombs with what? fireworks. Like Molotov cocktails? Like, no, like Molotov <laughs> cocktails and then leave a string of gunpowder to light it on fire so it would fucking go down the block. I mean, it was fucking nuts. Oh my god! It was nuts right. growing up. We blow we blew up this guy's mailbox. This kid we didn't like with a blockbuster, a quarter stick of dynamite. My sister was babysitting six blocks away and heard it. Oh my god! She was like, "I went to the I heard that. I went to the window. I like, yeah, we blew up his mailbox." You'd still be in jail today for some of this stuff. Like they they don't allow like I I don't think I've until I moved to L A. I didn't see fireworks or hear like it was only like towns had firework shows. Because they were, they were illegal in, in Massachusetts. Nobody lit a firework on the street? At the most I saw was sparklers. Oh, please. I know, yeah, I'm no, sorry. Spark- That's yeah. the shit I did when I was four. Like, exactly. You just light a sparkler, stand there like a fucking <laughs> yeah. half a fruitcake, and wait for it to sizzle out. Yeah, we, um, yeah when they sold that in the story, like, I, that's lame. Yeah. No, I'm sure some people had, like, they went to Pennsylvania or West Virginia or something, but it, there was nothing that I, that I knew of. Jews don't buy fireworks, I guess. What a fucking... And we used to go to the south of the border. We go to Florida every year with the family and the, the border, vacation. Yeah. Is that the station. still there? I I don't I I don't know. It's gotta look like it's nineteen twenty, because when I was a kid, 
it looked like it fucking see if south of the border. Remember all those signs? It, Where you is know, it? North Carolina. South I think Carolina? it's south. I think it's the it border of North Carolina. If you, south Carolina. if you drove from New York City to Miami, it was the middle. It was the middle, like, like twelve you, hour drive. Yeah, there. you stopped there and you got the rooms were shitty. So we'd stack up on all the fireworks. The there. food was shitty, but they'd sell yeah. fireworks. And they had every sign every like fifty miles. See, I, they they definitely have a established nineteen forty nine. Let me see where it is. I think they have it. Because they have a website. Was it a vacation spot? Or was it just a truck spot? It was a big truck stop. Big truck stop. You know, that was pretty (coughs) much... And you'd go there, you would eat, and the the main thing was the fireworks. Yeah, South Carolina. That's it. Yep. Interstate 95, that makes sense. Yeah, it was right off the highway going down to now, Florida. Did you ever just drive down there to go get fireworks and drive back? No, because we could always get them in New York, so we didn't have to. But if we went on a family vacation, we would stop there, and then we'd pick up a bunch of stuff. South of the border. There's a big gorilla out front. I don't yeah, know if you guys... Yeah, yeah. South of the fucking border. I forgot all <laughs> about that shit. I used to do those drives all the time when I was a kid. New York City to Miami and back with my uncles, my mom. Yeah. We always stop at fucking south of the border. I remember the food. I got sick there. Like, that's why I remember <laughs> south of the border, because the food was just fucking god awful. They had, like, generic hamburgers. Yeah, they have fucking... six restaurants, it says. Yeah, not not bueno. Or it wasn't back then, or I just got car sick or whatever. This is a time of the year, like, I haven't been to the shore in 30 years. Probably. Like, I have... Last time I was in Seaside Park... Had to be like 98. And I didn't wow. go on the water. I have not been on the Jersey Shore. No Asbury Park or any of that stuff when you go? Nothing. Since the 80s. I was telling you before the show, I went to Convention Hall last Sunday to see like a wrestling match. I took my kid there and his friend. Nothing's changed. Same chandeliers. Same everything. Right on the boardwalk in Asbury Park. No, I thought they cleaned all that up. Well, they, they left that, but they did. But that in, in that little indoor little mall where the convention hall is, it's still the same. You know, they got other shops and they're more modern shops, but they never changed anything because it was historic. So it's the same with the Stone Pony. They haven't changed anything. Now, it's tell historic me, tell me landmark. Cleaned up Newark. Newark is cleaned up. Well, people are moving to Newark now because they can't, because Hoboken's full. You know, Weehawken's full. Jersey City's full right now. So to try, so people of Newark is now people that want to live in New York that can't afford it. All these young people are moving now to now to start to build up Newark. Views of the Meadowland. That's the new thing. Oh, right. in Jersey. <laughs> views of the Meadowland. No more views of the George Washington Bridge because there's none left. Yeah. So now you have a view of the Meadowlands. That's the new thing when they sell a house now. What are you crazy? You got a view of the Meadowlands. It's beautiful out there. Who the fuck wants to see that shit? Yeah. I never understood that. And when I was shooting this movie, they said that they shot scenes in Newark. And they go, it's not good. That even at night, this was the good area. And it was kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's still bad. I mean, like, it's still bad. Yeah, I didn't what, know that at all. I was excited to go to Newark. Well, they got where the Devils play at that. Uh, right. The Prudential Center. Right. I should, you know, I and they have the concerts there. there. One time. Yeah. yeah the, it, when you get off the train in Newark off of New Jersey Transit, they have like a a skyway where you'd never have to hit the streets of Newark to get to the, the Prudential Center. They did that for the scared white people. Like, all right, listen, we'll go to Newark because we know we don't have to walk on the street to go if we take the train. Was that bad or it's still that bad? It's still around that area. I just did a gig around there about a year ago. It's bad. Wow. All right, but, you know, they have a lot of cops in that area, so they make sure because one white person, you know, gets killed there. No one's ever going to go there again, so they know. They block off the streets. They make sure it's safe for people coming in and out of those events there. They have a bunch of shows there now, too. So if people don't want to go to the garden or anything like that. But, yeah, so but they're starting to build it up because there's no more room in New Jersey and people that can't afford New York City. Queens is full. Brooklyn full. All of that stuff. It's too expensive. So they're actually coming to Newark now, which is crazy. Everything is fucking full. Three weeks I was there. I've never seen so many people in my fucking life. Man. Yeah. They got people on top of people. They got people on that top whole river of road down there. By you see all that shit that's there. I mean, I used to live in you know Cliffside Park and the Briarcliff, that big building that was built in 1972. That was like the only high rise in that area. That and the Galaxy, that was in West New York. Those are the only buildings and stuff. And it's like 
I, I, I didn't go back there for like 10 years. And I went down. I'm like, holy shit. It's fucking crazy. It's like $2,700 for rent for like a one bedroom, like on the water there. And people well, would just all that take. All that edge water is the Giants and the Knicks. And I saw Naughty by Nature when I was down there. The singer Trek. I saw him down there. Right. The UFC gym. You have that money. Tons yeah. Tons of money to live on that fucking thing now. And all those. That used to be rat infested when I was a fucking kid. It still is. It was from what you said. Yeah, it's rat infested. Yeah. Gross. Yeah, I mean, it just over the last. Me and Norton, me and Jim Norton wanted to move close to New York City, and we got a place in Cliffside Park. We were paying eight hundred dollars. It was a two bedroom for eight hundred bucks, and I had my girlfriend at the time living there, so we were splitting rent three ways, eight hundred dollars a month. It was fucking great. It was a shithole, but it was right in Cliffside Park. It was five minutes from the Lincoln Tunnel. 10 minutes from the George Washington Bridge. It was perfect. And we just set you shop really up can't there. Beat it. I love Cliffside Park. Yeah, I it was really great. About it. I love how quick you could be at the I used to walk from Cliffside to the bridge. I can't believe what they did around the bridge. There used to be a spot like a block from the George Washington Bridge where there was a red light like that one above you in front of it. And if that light was beeping, that means fresh bagels were coming out of the oven. Oh, damn. People would just fucking pull over and go in there and get a dozen. Fresh bagels out of the oven. The red light would just be blinking. I went up there. There's no more red light. The only thing that's still there is the tower, that that diner, the Fort Lee diner. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. That'll never go. Everything else is brand new and Korean. Yeah. <laughs> and Korean, yes. Jack. Yeah. If you don't oblo English there, if you don't speak Chinese or Korean, you are done in Fort Lee. Really? It's all Korean. They took over uh, Fort Lee, Pow Park. And Richfield Park. You're going to have to try some kimchi now. No. It's over. No, it's no, no, but it's everywhere. It's all Korean. The, the, the Fort Lee Saloon is gone. Babe's Taxi that was right under the bridge is gone. That is gone. All those days are long gone. The hip club up there was the Fort Lee Saloon. It was right on the side of George Washington Bridge. I asked my brothers, it's still there. Gone. Truffles, gone. All those bars along there gone. It's a complete different fucking world. Damn. And it's an expensive fucking world, too, to live up there. I used to think I wanted to live in New York. You do? Yeah. I It, it, seem, it seems like it'd be, for all the shitty parts, like the rent and too many people, it seems like, like there's no other place. I'm 56 years old, guys. How old are you? 54. You know what, man? New York does nothing for me now. Really? Yeah, because I'm 54 years old. I can't take advantage of what it's got to offer. I can't take advantage of what it's got to offer. New York is a late city, and not really. Not anymore. Not what I saw. You know, New York, when I was growing up, was a late city. Like, when Ari told me he was moving to New York, I said, go, because you're not going to make it happen here the way you live in New York. And he loves it. When Mitch Hedberg told me he was thinking about it, I go, go. Because if you're going to attack a certain, if if you can't sleep, New York is for you. Yeah. If you don't like going to bed at one and you like being out at one, you know, when I was shooting this, we were in Ridgewood, Brooklyn. Is it Ridgewood, Brooklyn or Ridgewood, Queens? Ridgewood, I'm Brooklyn. Sure. Okay. okay. This is a true story. We were, our call time was six sometimes. So you have to break six hours after your call time by law for lunch. Sometimes the night it was one night it was seven o'clock my call time, and at one o'clock we had lunch, and we had to drive from the set to the a place where we were eating like a downstairs of a church, and it was maybe guys six block drive on on Myrtle Street in Brooklyn, and I'm telling you this with fucking all the sincerity in the world, there was more businesses open. At one in the morning along that route, than there are in all of fucking this area where we live. Oh, yeah, there's nothing. There was more restaurants open on that strip. There was a vapor store <laughs> where it was open and they had 20 motherfuckers in there smoking fucking vapors out in <laughs> front of the fucking place. When we got to the place where we were eating, I was the Punisher. And I looked at him and I go, hey, man, did you notice that on the drive here on that fucking shitty street? There was more businesses in a 10-mile drive open, more places to eat hummus, sushi, fucking a, a cheesesteak place, bodegas up the ass, the Halal Cafe was open. 
All these things were open more than he. And he goes, imagine living up in, in fucking, where's he living not Ventura County. What's Alki? What's the name of it? Oh, uh, Ojai? Ojai. He goes, imagine living in Ojai. There ain't dick to eat after 7 o'clock. There was more businesses open on Myrtle Avenue in a five-minute drive than there was all of this at 9 o'clock. Like, if I say to you at 9 o'clock, you're hungry, what do we got? We got that shitty pizza, Tony's Pizza, and you got Denny's. And you got all these shitty taco stands that you don't know what you're eating. Yeah. And with all the fucking horse deaths in Santa Anita, <laughs> I don't trust none of these places. <laughs> with all these horses that are dying in yeah. Santa Anita, what, what, what are we up to, 30 yeah. this year and it's fucking June? It's not even June and 30 horses have died. That meat's got to go somewhere. <laughs> so if you're eating from food trucks in the L.A. area, I wouldn't fucking advise it. So my point is that it's a late night city. Right. You know, I have no use of being out at one in the morning. I don't want, if you got a spot for me at 1130, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Some of them go, you know, due to the comedy cell. I remember doing it over the summer, like 145 on yeah. the last spot. I'm like, I can't do this. Dang, it's just too late for me. Yeah, it's too. Uh, I'm past Can't that. Do I used I'm to done. do it all the time. My spot yeah. was one ten a.m. Yeah, no, I well, used to do it too. No problem. Used to do it too. So I have no use for New York. I love New York. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying to you, but I have no use for New York. I'm not gonna get in the fucking train and go do six spots on one night. That that ship sailed. You know, I don't have the. You know, if 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 I have a spot in the city. And I got to leave Edgewater and jump on a ferry and come over. That's going to be a deep spot. Like, you better think twice before you do it. So I have no use for New York in that way. I have to be honest with myself. Yeah. But me being 30, a young comic, I don't like to sleep anyway. Like, I'm not going to go to bed till 4 anyway. Like, Ari, I could call Ari at 1 here. And he picks <laughs> up like nothing. Hey, what's up? Nothing. What are you doing? I'm, I'm just sitting here. I, you know how many times I'm coming up over Laurel Canyon at 11.30 and I'll call Ari. And he answers the phone like nothing happens. 2.30 in the morning. Yeah, I, I like staying up but late. But that's what he lives for. You yeah. know, I don't have that use anymore. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to stay out till 1. No, because uh, yeah, I remember coming living right outside New York. My hours, I'd go to bed at 3 and get up around 10 or 11. So I could stay out. It didn't matter. But then, you know, as you get older and then you have a kid, I'm like, fuck that. I'm, you know... I'm not doing a midnight show. I'll do the 8 and 10.30 show at the stand or whatever like that, and then I'm done. I'm not running around doing seven different shows. I don't give a shit. I'm just going to stay in one spot. I'm not running I won't on a subway. Do late. Yeah, I'm not running on a subway going here and getting here and running no, on stage. And it's like, yeah, I'm good. I just need a couple sets. Even the store, I do the 9.15 on Saturday night. 9.15, I won't do it. I don't want to be at 11 o'clock. I got no use out there. 10.30, maybe the latest, on a Tuesday, 10.30 on Thursday. That's it. I can't even imagine being out at midnight anymore. It just changes it. Because for me, I've always a, loved that. I was going to add a second show at the Borgata. I'm not. It's an 11 o'clock show. Yeah. it's. I'm not adding an 11 o'clock show. Oh, dang, yeah. That would be late. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That means I don't get out of there till 1 or 2. I don't go to bed till 3, and I'm on the first flight out. It's not worth it to me. It's just so weird how it gets to the point, and it's not even being old. It's just you just don't see the use for it anymore. I don't have any use for it. I wish I did. I wish I could stay out till one, and I can't. What? For a young guy, yeah, there's some people that, that that fits your lifestyle. It fit my lifestyle 30 years ago. doesn't fit it today. You know, when I was doing three, four sets a night at 30 years old or whatever, I was doing like the same material. I wasn't really wor working on it. It wasn't special to me. I'm just like, okay, it's another set. As you get older, you'll do less sets, but it's more important to you. You go, okay, I need to work on these bits. I got to go out on the road. I got to come out with new material. So it's it, you really, it wasn't doing, just because I was doing more sets, I wasn't advancing my career at all. As you get older, you realize I got I got to, I really got to focus on these bits. There's too many distractions when I was 30. I'm just trying to get pussy. You know what I mean? After a show, was all, that's the only reason I was doing it. And I just, oh, the, the set's almost gotten away. Well, with anything, you learn how to work smarter. Yeah. With anything in your life, eventually you do it so long, you go, wait a second. I have to learn how to work this smart. You know, it's like I used to sit at a coffee shop for three hours. Now I sat at that coffee shop for an hour and 15 minutes. And I get done what I would have done in three hours. 
in the old days. Now I could do it. I get up, break for an hour, and then come back. You learn that if you sit there for three hours, after an hour and a half, you're not going to do anything anyway. You're going to make phone calls. You're going to look at something else. You're going to look at this on the computer. Fuck it. So now I'd rather sit there for an hour 15, give it an hour 15, and then I go to crowd therapy and break it up, go to the weed store. Then I go back to writing, and I get more. You learn from, uh, what was he what were we saying? That you work smarter. Work smarter, yeah. That's it. When I was young, too, I'd do 22 sets a week. You know, Yeah, that was necessary at the time, but I could have done the same damage by doing 16 sets. Five of those sets I didn't necessarily have to do, but as a young comic, you can't turn down anything. No. You're in no position to turn down anything as a young comic. Your first 15, 20 years, you can't turn down dick. You know, you're coming off a plane, they got a spot for you, you do it. Now I got a family, I have age, I have a lot of things that I have to give my time to. It's hard. It's hard when you have a child. You know, yeah. you have your child full time pretty much. Yeah. Three days a week. Three. You have to give them all the attention they could. You know, people get mad at me. Oh, you don't get high online no more. You know why I can't get high at 8 in the morning no more? Because I got 22 things to do at 9.30. And I can't <laughs> walk into these places with my eyes red. I walked into the daycare once at 4. And they told my wife, he stunk like fucking weed. <laughs> <laughs> the daycare. I, I can't fucking walk into a, a school smelling like fucking yeah. weed. I got, I got to deal with parents and whatnot. So your priorities change. So you learn how to work smarter. And in the end, I wish somebody told me this when I was starting that it's working smart. It's working all day, but working smart. I get more done in eight hours than most people do in a week. I can do more in eight hours. I have everything written down. I just spew it out and I'm done for the week. I love living like that. Yeah. Doing everything I have to by Wednesday and the rest of the week I have nothing to do but maybe work out. That's I got the same thing. Like my son goes to school, gets on the bus at eight, he gets home at three, off the bus, it's right in front of my house. I know from eight to three, I got to get all my. You got shit everything done. done. I got everything done. done. So when he gets off that bus at three, it's all we're just ha we're hanging, whatever he wants to do, wherever he wants to go, whatever. So I just know get all that shit done. I got that window. Don't fuck it up. And yeah, by Wednesday, I'm done with all my shit. I got my kid Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm doing gigs, or I take the time off, or do whatever. And I get all my shit. Yeah. And I was never, I never had discipline like that. If you were never good in school with discipline, I'm sure you weren't either. You just got by. You're like, whatever. I cheated on whatever I could just to fucking, you know, get C's and B's just to get by. You, It's tough to have that discipline later in life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you're a good student, you will, you know, even your 20s, you're going to be focused and stuff. I was never, I'm just like, all right, I'll just, I was just lazy about it. But then as you get older, you realize, all right, I got to have some structure. And I, that didn't teach me in school because I didn't care. I didn't want to be there. I was disinterested. You know, some of the stuff I was interested in, you know, if it, it, but most of the stuff I was, I'm like, I don't give a shit. This, I'm never going to need geometry ever in my life. I'm never going to need algebra. I don't give a fuck about this. Would so, you have gotten into an art school when you were in high school if they had one available to you? And like, probably, yeah. Like right now where I went to high school, they have a school you could go to. Yeah, there's a, there's a communications yeah, high school. Yeah, communications what it's high yeah. school. They do podcasting, they do plays, they do a thousand fucking things, and they don't have to take geometry. You know, would you have gone to one? Without I would, a doubt. I wouldn't have gone. I didn't know I was interested. Well, I went to a community, there was a community college near me, Brookdale Community College, and they had a, a communications course. They had TV, they had acting classes, you make your own videos, your TV thing. So I was like, that's where I want to go. So when I got to college, I'm like, this is what I want to do. They had radio stations there, they had a you know, local radio stations on campus to teach you all that stuff. So I loved it when I got there. And that's when I really started applying myself. I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to do. It, it does. It makes a huge difference if you're interested in it. If, it. if it's something that you enjoy versus something that you feel like you have to do. I always enjoyed movies, but I never saw me in them. Right. Like, I always enjoyed movies, and I had a secret uh, dream to be in movies. But I just never thought I was good enough to get in them, or, and I didn't know where to start. I didn't know anything about an acting class. I knew nothing about casting people, and nobody ever told me. And I, I was always too scared to ask. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew that I wanted to get into movies. And then when I was 21 or 20, I met John Link, and he was a big-time editor. He edited it like Above the Law, Commando. I met him in Aspen, and I became friendly with him, and I would just tell him, put me in a movie. And he would go, are you fucking crazy? Are you retarded? I just can't put you in a fucking movie. 
And then I met another friend of mine who had a friend that was a camera guy out here. So I would torment him. But I never knew anything about this shit. I didn't know how to get started, who to ask. I always thought stand-up comics called the place and said, hey, I'm coming down there, tape me. And that's right. especially, I didn't know that there was any work involved. I didn't know they had a workout material. I didn't know any of that shit. I just thought they went down there and did an hour just like that and just went home. And that's the only time they would do it. I had no idea about what went into it. Yeah, well, when I went to the college, I started taking the acting class in there. Because I'm like, I wanted to be in that kind of, my dad was an accountant and all that stuff. And he was more of a numbers guy. And that's what he wanted me to do. I'm like, that's not my thing. Right. My brother's in the real estate. I'm like, that's not my thing either. But when I, I saw the acting and the radio and the TV stuff, I'm like, that's what I want to do. So we, I started taking acting classes in college. Me and a couple of my buddies that I grew up with, we all went to the same school. We, you know, we took the same classes, so we'd all commute. It was only like 20 minutes away from us. And then we'd, every acting uh, scene that we do, we always made sure we can drink in it because we were fucking, you know. <laughs> so we'd always have that championship season, I remember, was one where to drink. And we always take scenes where we're fucking getting drunk because you're allowed to do it and if that was part of the scene. So we'd have two, you know, 12 pack of Bud cans, fuck, and then we'd be fighting and all that shit. So it was great. And even that day, I remember the teacher calls out, like, every scene you guys do, you guys are drinking. I'm like, yeah, if we can drink at school, how fucking great is that? My buddy had a bad tooth, my buddy Kevin. He had a bad tooth, and he brought a, a, an eight-pack of, of, of Bud Nips into class, and he didn't want to go to the dentist, so he's drinking in the back of the class his Bud Nips to kill the pain in college. And nobody said he had the eight pack. He had the, the, the eight pack right on the table. Remember them Bud Nips? Oh, I love those. And <laughs> yeah, the fucking things were great. But six case. You got six eight packs in the case. Yeah, six fucking eight packs. <laughs> oh my god, I love those nips. And you know who had a better one? Coors. Coors. Oh, they had the little ones they too. Had the little cans, six ounces. Ooh. Oh yeah, the little yeah. And you could fucking freeze them. They would stay colder, and you could just down them in one fucking. And I hate beer. Yeah. I hated beer back then. Really? That's and all I, we drank. And I would buy an eight pack of Coors and just crack it and just drink it in one fucking sip. Didn't even taste like beer. That's why I always loved Colorado. When I tasted Coors, I'm like, wait a second. I got to get out to fucking Colorado. They know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But I used to taste it because Budweiser, Budweiser makes the eight ounce nips. Miller made them too. Yeah, they did. Miller, Miller had them. It was fucking horrible, horrible beer. But the best beer I used to like nips was Lone Brow. Lone Brow. Lone Brow used to make nips. With that tinfoil on the fucking cap. Used to good friends. Tonight is kind of special. <laughs> Lone Brow. So what the fuck are you doing in town? Really, Crank Yankees? Yeah, Crank Yankees is coming back after 12 years on Comedy Central. That's cool. Wow. We had a run from 2002 to 2007. It got canceled. Who was on with you? Jimmy Kimmel, Adam Carolla. They started the show. Because they were, they, they were on the man show at the time. So the man show was kicking ass on Comedy Central. And they go, hey, we have an idea to do prank calls and recreating with puppets. So they gave him, Comedy Central gave him six episodes right off the bat, guaranteed him, which is rare before it even had. And so they go, All right. and then they heard my shit on Howard Stern because I had these prank calls that I'd mess with, turn around with telemarkers. He was playing. I'm like, we want that dude to be on our show. And I remember my manager telling me, go, hey, man, they want this is new show on Comedy Central. They're going to make prank calls with, with puppets, and they like your calls, so they want you to be part of it. I'm like, that's fucking, that's probably the worst idea ever. All I thought about is my comic friends making fun of me that I'm going to be on this show that's going to be fucking horrendous. He's like, look, the guaranteed six out. I go, I'll do it, but I'm going to get fucking shit. That's all I thought. And the, the show just took off. And I was the only unknown comic to do it. Everybody, you know, they just heard my shit. Like, you know, it was Sarah Silverman, Jimmy, Adam Carolla, Dave Chappelle, Tracy Morgan, Wanda Sykes, you know, Dane Cook, Dennis Leary, David Tell, Kevin Nealon. And I was like, the, the, like I was plucked out of obscurity at that time. And that fucking, my career just took off from that, just from making prank calls. I could be wrong, but to, that was like my height of... Like, like Comedy Central back then was the channel, it seemed like. It was huge because we were on right after South Park, right before Jon Stewart. So it was a perfect spot on Tuesday nights. Yeah, that was a big that was a big show. I love that show. So, yeah, 12 years later, they just decided it's going to come back 20 episodes on Comedy Central. So I was out 20 here. 20 fucking 20 episodes. episodes. So I just did a whole recording session just the other day out here. And I'm going to go back, do some more. but Because I do two characters on the show. So That's fucking crazy. great. I'm like, I'm a middle-aged man making prank phone calls. <laughs> I was burping into the phone two days ago, drinking a Diet Coke and burping. 
And I'm like, this is fucking, this is beautiful. How's my son ever going to go to college? How can I ever tell him to go? Like, you need an education. (laughs) It's great. Now they got to bring back the heavy metal show. That's what I'm hoping, because Viacom's bringing back all these old shows, like on MTV and all this stuff, because they realized that they just, you know, got rid of all these shows that were pretty popular, and then put new shit on they have none of their shows have gotten ratings in years so now mtv comedy central and hopefully vh1 does it at some point brings back shows that actually got ratings so you never know if that the, that metal show comes back because that was part of viacom family on vh1 i mean they just got rid of it dumped it and you know it was a corporate thing viacom was losing a ton of money nickelodeon was their cash cow and kids just started watching fucking cartoons on ipads and and shit like that. So they stopped watching there. And that was it. And then when John Stewart left and then uh yeah. Stephen Colbert left that hour or you know, whatever that window, the Comedy Central's ratings just went in the shitter. And that was part of Viacom. So when they came in, they just got rid of the whole VH one classic channel. And our show was the only original show on there. So it wasn't because we weren't getting ratings. They just needed to make major cuts. How long was the heavy metal show on? Twelve years, right? No, it was on for eight years, hundred and thirty episodes. Jesus we Christ. did. It was insane. It's the greatest because they were just, it was the only original program. So it was just on constantly. Like if you look at True TV, Impractical Jokers is on all day, all night. And that's the exposure we got on BH1 Classic. So it was perfect for us because we were constantly on TV. Every time you turn that, we, you know, there was another show on with Slash or whoever we had. That's awesome. Yeah. So, but look, I mean, that's, you know, it's an obscure. That music is not that popular, so it couldn't be on a regular channel. It couldn't be on Fox after The Voice. Well, you know, if we're interviewing, you know, L.A. Guns or something like that, that's it's, it's a small market for that. So that channel was perfect. It was a little shitty channel, channel like 361 on VH1, on your, you know, DirecTV. No one bothered us there. No one give a, gave a fuck. There's no more music shows, though, really, on TV. Yeah, you got The Voice and all that shit. Right, but yeah. And I want to see that as much as I want to see <laughs> fucking porn. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to see that shit. Yeah. You know, I grew up on the Midnight Special. I grew up on Don Kirsch's Rock Concert. I grew up on fucking uh, American Bandstand. They had time for all these type of shows. Soul Train. How long was fucking Soul Train? Is Soul Train still on? No. No, but... no Don Cornelius is dead and buried. Yeah. But now it's like, I want to see a show where they, they just got rid of What's-His-Name show, didn't they? He just taped his last show. And that was a music show, Young Bands at Night, NBC. Oh, Carson Daly. Carson Daly. Right. Wasn't he doing that? Yeah. So he's gone. Well, do you think, because before it used to be like 18 to 36 was the, the big age group you needed to get. Do you think it's getting older? Like maybe like 28 to 48, like like those people who still have cable. and Like, cause it, like those are the people who used to watch Crank Yankers and are going to watch it again now that it's coming back out. Like I think maybe like the young kids, they're just like, they're not watching TV, so let's make stuff. For people who actually are, but you know, if a band releases a video, they'll still they'll get like you know three million views in in a day and a half if they're popular. You know, it's on YouTube. The yeah, they're video. watching it somewhere else. So people are still watching it. You know, they're like, why would you make a video anymore? No one's watching. They are. I mean, you you look at like the Slipknot has a new video out. There's forty five million views after a week. Dang. You know, so you you people will still see it, but I think it's. I think, you know, music's not important to people's lives. There's way too many distractions. If we had these phones when we were kids, we probably wouldn't have been in the heavy metal. We wouldn't be sitting in on a Friday night reading the back of the lyrics of a Black Sabbath record because we were bored. We had nothing else to do. They got so much distraction on that phone, they don't give a fuck about music. You know what I mean? Because they got there's, there's too much there's too much information there. There's too much entertainment on that. So th- the music's not important to people anymore. Right. So that's why there's no there's not going to be a music show because nobody g- really gives a shit. You know, the young generation is like ah, it's just music, whatever. I don't know. look. I you know I could text my you know six of my friends right now. We're in a mass text, just fucking bullshitting back and forth. People don't go to uh, uh, Dorfman from Nashville was telling me he went to see the Grateful Dead in Boulder. It was just a bunch of rich rich kids with dead shirts on. Didn't know the music. Didn't know anything. It's like Coachella. A bunch of people go to those shows, and they don't know what's going on. They just go to walk around. They pay a 1000 bucks, yeah. whatever it is, for those fucking tickets. They do whatever drugs they do, and they just fucking walk around. I don't know. I don't know what happened to music. I can't put, you know, it's, listen, I'm, I'm happy for Guns N' Roses. Like, I'm happy for all those bands that are still touring. 
But isn't it fucking weird that 30 years later, I mean, this is it. We have Guns N' Roses. That's it. I mean, you went to see Bob Seger. Elton John's making his goodbye fucking tour mm -hmm. run. But, and bands are touring. I mean, that's the only way for them to make money. They're making a fortune, VIPs. Now that you have to I VIP. heard the figure that Kiss made so far this year. Yeah, they the first leg or the second first leg, leg the first leg or like fifty seven million. A fucking they're, amazing. Yeah, they're grossing like over a million dollars a night. Now all the bands are doing the VIP packages if you want to meet them because they're not getting the record sales anymore. You know, so they're not getting that money from from everyone buying a million people. Bands would sell a million copies in the first week. You know, they they hit plat a gold, which is five hundred thousand sales every. Like Judas Priest would put a record out in nineteen eighty six. Within two weeks, it was already they sold five hundred thousand. Now the only bands that will sell five hundred thousand or a million records are like Kanye, Jay Z, the Foo Fighters, and you know a couple other bands. That's it. No one sells that many records. You're lucky to sell a hundred thousand. When you would sell two million, you're lucky to sell two hundred fifty thousand. So they charge extra for the tickets. That's why the concert tickets are so much. And then they have a VIP thing. If you want to meet the band before, get a picture with them. Sometimes they'll they'll do, you can go to the sound check. Sabbath had a thing last tour, their last tour, where you can watch the sound check. It was part of a VIP package. And so they you know, they play like three songs, which was great. I mean, I knew to be, I got hooked up. So me and Jim Norton went and we watched the sound check. My, my, I took my son to see the sound check. He fucking saw Iron Man. It was me, Jim Norton, <coughs> my son, and like five other people. It was fucking great. Wow. So that's uh, that's how they're making money, these bands. But that's why all these bands are out there, you know, because there's so much money to be made. So they're going to keep touring all these old bands like, holy shit, look at this. I get, Elton John, I paid 350 bucks for a ticket. Bob Seger, I paid 310 Who are you looking forward to see this summer? Anybody that's coming around? That, you know, I've seen everybody a million times. I'm getting to the point where, you know, Rob Zombie and, and Marilyn Manson are touring. I'll see that. I'm a big Slipknot fan. I really like the energy of that band. I've been a, and my son loves them. It's his favorite band. So we're going to go see them. I'm going to go see Ted Nugent. Is playing right near my house. Uncle Ted. Where? He's playing at the Starland Ballroom in Sayreville, New Jersey. Oh no shit. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't wait. I saw him about two years ago. He's great. He doesn't really talk politics in a show. You know, he says, but it's just fucking, you know, opens up with, you know, free for all, goes into dog eat dog. Fucking, it's phenomenal. What was the last time you saw Ted? About two years ago. I saw no him at BB Kings in New York City. And he was phenomenal. Phenomenal. So great. And you're going to see the Stones. Going to see the Stones. Yeah, Where at? They just Stones are playing um, uh, MetLife Stadium with the Giants and Jets. What did you play. drop for the tickets? I didn't get a ticket yet. They're playing two nights. So I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll get them the, couple, the day of. Or I looked last week. They're up there. Yeah. You go on StubHub. I'll get them. I usually get tickets off StubHub. You know, I'll get them there and then, you know, a couple of days before or whatever. So, yeah, I'm going to go see the Stones. I saw the Stones already, but, you know, this is the mix 75. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to go see them. I'm going to go see Slipknot. Uh, Corn and Alice in Chains are touring this summer. So I'll probably go see that show. Nothing that really sticks out for me. I know. Who's Judas Priest out with or they're not? Um, they're, they're, they're doing a bunch of festivals. I just did a festival down in North Carolina. There's a new band that I, I saw down in North Carolina. I like this band called Dirty Honey. They're out of Los Angeles. They're a cross between like Old Aerosmith, A Little Zeppelin, and Guns N' Roses. They just have an EP out. They're really good. I saw them at some festival a couple of weeks ago. They got some heat. They only got five songs out, but they got that old school sound. The key is what, like, there's a band, Greta Van Fleet, that sounds like Zeppelin. If the young kids can get into these these new rock bands, because the kid, the guys are young in the band. They're 21, 22. If this new generation of kids can get into it, that will bring that music, that music back. Right now, you got a bunch of middle-aged dudes going to watch 20-year-olds play shit that sounds like Zeppelin. You're not getting that younger generation. You're not getting 17, 18-year-old kids that are into the band Greta Van Fleet who are selling like 6,000 tickets. They sell out in two seconds or whatever. And there's all these other young bands. So if you get that young generation into that, rock, the rock music will come back. You need that because someone's going to have to do that. Like, it's just, you know, when you go see Guns N' Roses, yeah, maybe you'll bring your kid because they know Paradise City and Welcome to the Jungle. But that's what, that's when we when we're growing up, you know, our, our older brother, my older brothers got me into that stuff. So we got into it young, you know, ACDC and going to all those shows. But right now, any new band that's coming out that's got some heat that's pretty good, it's just middle aged dudes. 
going to see him. I went to bands. I liked. I, I still love music. I mean, sixty percent of my day is music related. I got music on in the house or whatever. But for me, going to concerts was a social thing. Like I, it was for my buddies, and we'd plan it, and we'd get a bag of reefer, and God knows what else. It was a social thing. Yeah, you know. Again, now I'm going to go see the Stones maybe up in Pasadena in August. I'm not sure yet. But I don't know if it's that much of a social thing for kids anymore. Like, we were up on that. Like, I went to see Prince for 15 bucks at a club. Like, the kids I grew up with were into that. I had kids, I had friends that that's what they did. Like, Mauricio Alvarado, Mm -hmm. that's what he does. He goes to concerts every night. He goes to see whoever. He don't give a fuck if it's Aretha Franklin, Def Leppard, Devo, punk. You know, when you're just a fan of music. Like, I was a fan of music. You said something interesting that was earlier. Growing up, you had the jocks and the heads. I grew up with jock heads. Like, we lifted weights. We ran. We ate good, but we also snorted coke and fucking smoked. Oh, yeah, see, we didn't. Our, and our... went to concerts. Like, we were one of those people. We we would lift before we go to a concert. Like, yeah, we're going to lift till 6, go home, take a shower, and then go to the concert and get a grandma blow. Like, we did all that shit, but we were combination head jocks. Like, there was no heads and the, they didn't like the jocks. Nah, we smoked dope and we fucking tackled people. Yeah, we know it was the jocks and the burnouts. The burnouts, that's yeah. what they call The guys that smoked outside the smoking section in between class. We were the burnouts. We were guys with the Aussie shirts and the Judas Priest shirts. And then the jocks were the guys that all played sports. And they usually got the hot chicks. we get some of those burnout chicks. There would be a couple, you know, that came from a broken home. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, all right, cool. You know, and it, there wasn't that many of them. But, uh, you know, so, but the jocks always got the hot chicks. And we're just, you know, we're wearing concert shirts every Every day to school, and you know, no girls like, yeah, I, I don't even know what Judas Priest is. You're just weird. How was your show last night with Crazy Kate? It was great. I how's, love Kate. How's Crazy Kate doing? These she's days? she's doing. She seems very zen. She seems like she, you know. No, I love Kate, man. I I got a special place in my heart for I her. Does she? She fucking. She's out there. You know what I mean? Busting her ass every night. She's like a dude. She just fucking, I don't she care. Give, a fuck. give me a yeah, stage. Give me a stage. No problem. I'll do my jokes. Doesn't bitch. Just low maintenance. She sees it for what it is. Now. Yeah, low maintenance yeah. on the road. Does it just like, all right, if this is what I got to deal with, this is what I got to deal with, you know? Hecklers, whatever. So, uh, yeah, it was great, you know? And when do you go back to the big bad fucking apple? I'm going back tomorrow. Well, tonight on the Red Eye. That's it. Going back. I got a show with Sam Tripoli tonight. We're doing some, uh, I don't know, some naughty show thing somewhere you know hit a red eye got my boy tomorrow that's we it hang out it's fucking great yeah and what are you doing for the summer beside these shows you going down to shore at all yeah we got a family vacation in long beach island we rent the house every year our family got one like right on the beach we all chip in there's seven of us and all the kids parents. and all that stuff no no parents but you know my brothers and sisters their kids you know so uh it'll be the first year my mom passed away in november 80 that's years right. old Sorry. So that was like, you know, this would be the first vacation without her, which is, you know, she always loved it and helped run and all that stuff. But, you know, um, but yeah, it's great. And the kids, you know, the beach is right there. We're in Long Beach Island. They got the fucking rides and all that shit. So it's going to be great. And the concerts. And then my boy, we'll just hang out. You know, I don't put them in, in uh, camp or anything like that. I'm like, no, you play with your friends on the fucking block. You wake up at nine in the morning. I'll see you in a few hours. You hang on my house, they hang at their There's house. Nothing like that. It's here. fucking great. They got sleepovers and all that shit, you know. They're in my basement going crazy. How old's your boy now? He's eight. He's oh, turning yeah, nine, yeah. yeah. He, That's a great fucking crazy age. Oh, yeah. He you got him fireworks this year? Uh, no, yeah, I got, you know, they'll actually sell them at the Walmart in, in Jersey. They'll sell, not like the crazy stuff, but a lot of shit that shoots in the air. So you buy a whole thing of like a hundred bucks and we'll blow it. We'll, you know, shoot the stuff up in the air. He loves it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we wait till it's nighttime. We shoot it up, so we get a bunch of it all the time. He loves us. Show a quarter fucking stick. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Probably not. You know, like a pack of fireworks. I remember being like thirty five cents. Thirty five cents, exactly. 35 and there was like twenty twenty five crackers in it or dollar. something. Yeah, I'd bang them out for a dollar. The the sticks were fifty cents. Bang them for a dollar. We'd buy a big bag of weed off this dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my brother's friend was dealing in high school. He would just come with a brown bag of just weed and just be, you know, selling it to people right in the right in the hallway. 
and then we buy it and then we roll up joints and we sell the joints for three bucks. You know, me, we'd make like two bucks on the joints. We'd sell 10 for, you know, you know, because we're like, come on, man. I'm like, hey, man, it's 10 joints, $22. Because usually a joint was a dollar back dollar, in the day. Yeah. yeah. So we get like 22 bucks for 10 joints. Dude, you're going to buy it off some guy in the street. You're going to go to New York to get this shit. You know, just yes. give me the fucking money. There's yeah, no seats in the cups. And then we'd walk to 7-Eleven with a bottle of Southern Comfort and drink it along the way and go buy porno magazines. Get, in get high hot. school? Yeah, high school, yeah. Grammar school. Who gives a fuck? Around 8th, 9th, 10th grade. I smoked my first weed at 12 years old. I was at a concert and they were passing along. That's what they did. It just passed it along. My brother's with me. I'm like, can I? He's like, yeah, all right. I'm fucking, I was high at 12. I mean. It's beautiful. What date you got coming up? Anything good? Uncle Vinny's June 1st, Point Pleasant, New Jersey. We were talking about that before. And I'll see you August. You'll be around? Yeah, I'm going to be around. I'm not going back to Jersey till August. I only fly in that day. And yeah. I'll be in D.C. that Friday. So I don't even get that. I think, yeah, that's, I'll be down there. Um, I'm going to come down that night. You're in August 10th. And my comedy special, I Got the House, is out. When I did released. that come out? That came out a couple months ago. You can stream it on um, Amazon Prime or it's on iTunes. It's all about my divorce. And you released it yourself. I released it myself. Good for you. You don't need no Own the whole no fucking thing. Yeah, you don't need nothing. It doesn't matter. I tell people it's everywhere but Netflix. And I don't care. Like, if I can't get a Netflix deal, it doesn't matter. And you own your shit. You know how much money you're going to make on this shit when you own it five, ten years from now? People fucking will find you. When they yeah, really they'll find it. They, everybody find can find you. it. They'll find it. And my podcast is uh, every Monday, Comedy Metal Midgets. That's the podcast? Yeah, or that's serious what, show? No, that's what it's called. My podcast is called Comedy Metal Midgets. Okay, my, my serious show is called Metal Midgets. Now, when does the serious show come out? Every Thursday. Okay. And they replay it a, a few times during the week. Like I said, I'm lost, but I usually catch it on serious. And like I said, last Sunday I caught it, and you played something tremendous by Priest. And I was like, <laughs> fucking, that's tremendous. I forgot all about it. I think it was one of the un one of the songs from the live album. Unleashed in the East. Studio, though. I think it was. Like, oh, maybe uh, Running Wild? Something. You played. It was something priesty. But, right. But fuck it. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank friend. you, man. Thank you very much for coming out. I want to thank Jim Florentine for coming on the show. And don't forget, motherfuckers, tickets are almost sold out for June 1st at the Ice House working out with Uncle Joey. We also have the Fillmore Theater in New Orleans on June 7th and the Tabernacle Theater in Atlanta, Georgia on June 8th. Tickets still available for the Fillmore Theater in New Orleans and for the 8th at the Tabernacle. Come on down, bitches. I want to give a shout-out to our sponsors. The church is brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, Uncle Joey's here to tell you something. The suffering ends now. You ever ask your girlfriend or your wife to trim the fucking bush around your dick or your ball sack? You're sitting there looking up in the air waiting to fucking get killed. Because without your dick, that's what you feel. You feel like you're dead. Well, the suffering ends today, okay? With Manscaped, you get it done without the pain and anxiety. You're like, why, Joey? Why? I'll tell you why. Because they got precision tools for the family jewels, you fucking cocksuckers. Manscaped has redesigned the electric razor. They've invented, it's called the Lomo, a handheld razor with skin-safe technology so it won't nick or snag your nutsack. You got to go easy on what, what the fucking Lord gave you, right? You don't want to show up with a dick with fucking bruises on it and stitches and shit like this. This bad boy will leave your area nice, clean, smooth, pain, and anxiety-free. Plus, it's rechargeable and easy to hold. So you get into all the nooks and crannies by your asshole and under your nutsack so there's no misunderstandings. Manscaped will get your beanbag looking as smooth as a fucking egg. You understand me? And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you trim the hedges, the fucking love stick looks a lot bigger. Now, what are you waiting for? Trim up that fucking dick of yours at manscaped.com. They'll give you everything you need to make your balls shine, your dick look bigger, and your dick look pretty like it's going to the Oscars. When was the last time you got <laughs> your dick ready for the Oscars? You have it. With Manscaped, it looks like your dick is going to the Oscars. And if this is the first time you've con you considered manscaping, they got a deal for you. You ready? They got something called the Perfect Package. It comes with the low mower and a safety razor, plus the crop preserver, a specially formulated deodorant so your balls don't stink like a fucking dead animal, and the reviver. You keep them in the car in little packages. It spritz that tones and refreshes your nutsack and your dick bowl to keep you nice and clean in the summertime. You understand me? 
And right now, the church family can get 20% off your first order when you use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, at manscaped.com. And if you order the perfect package, they'll also throw in a free travel bag when you use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H. So go to manscaped.com, use promo code CHURCH, and I'm going to give you 20% off your first order, and you're going to get the perfect package. You're going to be tip-top magoo for the rest of the year. You understand me? You're going to be getting dates. Women are going to enjoy sucking your dick and licking your nutsack. Why? Because at manscaped.com, that's what they're striving for. More, bo- more blowjobs and less stinky fucking dicks. Now keep your balls clean, but it starts with manscaped.com. The church is also brought to you by On It. Why, Joey? Why do you like On It so much? Why? Because their supplements are clean, Bobby. They got fucking bats. They got kettlebells. I can't help you with that. As far as the supplements, the protein powders, the beef jerky, the jerky, the fucking ultra, the shroom tech immune, the shroom tech fucking, what's the other one? Sport. Sport, which will give you more oxygen. Shroom, uh, on it is the way to go. Let me say it. Alpha brain, you're a little cloudy. You're feeling like you can't focus. Give Alpha Brain a fucking challenge. You understand me? Give them a little try. If you don't like it, they give you 100% money back guarantee and they don't want the product. Who else does that? Nobody. That's why I deal with Onnit, and that's why I suggest you go to Onnit. If you're looking for these type of supplements, do me a favor. Go to Onnit.com right now and look at the great selection that they have, whether it's protein you need, whether it's the melatonin, whatever you need, they got the oil for the fucking coffee. They got it all. Go to onit.com right now. You find something you like, press in. Charge. And get 10% off delivered right to your fucking crib. You don't even got to leave the house, all right? So I want to thank Manscaped. I want to thank Onit. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys on Memorial Day for making this podcast fucking a savage that it is. And most importantly, for listening and for supporting us. So I want to thank Jimmy. I want to thank the fucking Christ killer. But I want to thank you motherfuckers for always being solid. I'll see you back here Thursday morning, ready to rock. It's the end of the month, bitches. Get your shit together. If you're going to be alive, this is the week to do it. Now go get yourself one. Kick this motherfucker, Mule Lee.